stupid face. The face where it says live, but you don't know if that's a lie, right? <laughs> so you got to click the refresh like a couple times. You're like, all right, let's just kind of make sure. Yep. Okay, fine. Um, and then we'll be off to the races pretty soon. Right. Um, but I'll tell you what, it's it's a pleasure to have you. This is the first time you and I have actually spent, like, I guess you could say real time together or something like that. Yep. Um, and we've like rotated around each other for like, what, two years, three years Something along those lines. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. And, you know, the, the um, you know, a lot's changed for me, which we'll get into. Um, but, but mostly, I, you know, I was sort of operating my own little corner intentionally. Like, mm -hmm. don't bother me, but I have this high ticket program where I'm coaching agency owners. Um, and I was kind of a jerk about it. Like at certain times, people think I'm a jerk and stuff like that. And, you know, I'm like, look, you know, what? we don't have an easy job here. Okay. That's the first thing I want to say about that is yeah. Any agency owners is not an easy gig. Everyone thinks it is, you know, everyone portrays it like, like it is, but that's not really the case. Um, and that's true. Just like in any business, I think is like, it always looks better from the outside than it does on the inside, like the day to day of it. Um, but for that reason, right. Like I, I got hyper focused on the couple things that we're super good at and, mm -hmm. Um, you know, I went through a period of maybe like trying to like, like we've expanded and contracted over the past few years and we dipped our toe into other things because our, our clients and our customers wanted that sort of yep. thing. And what's changed between now and then has just been, I've, I've been like, look, there's plenty of people that do this way better than I do, like certain mm -hmm. facets of the, of the business. And so now I'm more in like a collaborative phase of, of things where I just want to share all the awesome stuff that we've learned about the thing that we're really good at. And then sort of like, you know, we talked about at the high level um, yep. uh, event, you know, we're backstage getting ready to go on stage and, and uh, be presented with those really cool awards they give us. And I'm like, dude, I'm just done trying to teach everything that everybody I'm, yep. I'm hiring from teaching new topics. I'd rather learn more from a guy like Jeff than me trying to go out there and you know, act or pretend like I'm good at it and go through the learning curve to get good at it. Yeah. I, I just think it's way better to be more collaborative in this current environment more now than it's ever been. That's kind of where my new mindset is last half of last year, moving into 2023. That's do you, do you think that's like, because of like the tech and the industry that we're in, or do you just think that's like a normal business growth kind of thing? Like when you become in your senior year, you're definitely different than your freshman year, right? Yeah. So do you think that's what's going on? I think it's both, man. Honestly, like, you know, I, I went through a phase where I was like, this high level thing is like a home run, right? And yeah. and I was I was there at the beginning and um and it was the first time where something that I was I got really good at on my own, like mm -hmm. innovated to a certain degree was being mimicked, stolen, copied, resold online. Like all I know that feeling. <laughs> and I'm like a fighter, dude. Like I'm 6'4", 230, and if you get my fucking face, I'm going to beat your ass. Like that's my attitude is just like, you know, and, and I'm not like, I'm not like that day to day, but you know what I mean? Like if you pick a fight with me, I'm a fighter, dude. I'm going to fight you. I fought the federal government and won, Bailey versus yep. USA. Okay, it took almost a decade, which is a whole other story. That's a personal story, not a business story. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I'm like, you know, you want to pick a fight with me, I'm going to do my best to kind of like make you regret that decision. Right. Yeah. Well, online it's constant. Yeah. You know? And so I went through that sort of phase after people like, like Billy Jean is one of my mentors now one of my great friends and people either love or hate Billy Jean seemingly online, but he told me that he's like, get ready for like jerks to be poking, trying to poke holes in you and stuff. Yep. And he's like, you know, miserable, pe miserable people are everywhere. So you just have to kind of like accept it. Right. For the, over a couple of year period, it kind of helped me get over that whole thing. And I don't, so I think it was mostly about me to answer your question. You know, I got, I got very tired of being in the public eye. It, it's mm. more like, you know, running ads with my face on it or whatever the case may be, you know, cause my family and I are fairly private. I, yeah. I want to share the business lessons. I think it's life changing for families and for people in our space. And there's never been a better time to do what we're doing 
than right now, more, mm -hmm. tools, more resources, higher leverage, like all that stuff, passionate about that in an ideal world, no one would know what I look like, what my name is yeah, at all. And I would still be helping these people, but that's the trade off that I'm dealing with, you know, yeah. it just is. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it was like a, a mat maturation process that was new for me over the past four or five years. Yeah. That I didn't have to deal with with my agency. And my agency, I, no one knew who I was. That just my clients were like, are you getting me a result? Yes or no. So then, that's that's a really good segue. Because yeah. when we think about like growth, it always happens in stages. Yeah. Like we think of like the innovation and then it goes up and down and like process maturity and all that. Right. And I want to flash back to what you just mentioned, which is your agency, okay. which has gone through iterations just like mine. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to go back to like, Way back in the day, we're talking, you started your marketing agency. Yep. Can you lead me up to that point? Like, what was that three, six, nine, or 12 month journey leading up to where you say, like, I'm going to start a marketing agency? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so, a lot of times you all see me wearing a hat, usually. Um, and that's be because I've got skin cancer. I've had two surgeries on my face to remove skin cancer, but I always, sport a South Coast hat. And the reason why is my best friends in San Diego, who I was roommates with before they got married, um, <laughs> we, we all kind of lived in this house by the beach. And um, it is so San Diego, by the way, that's like, so the perfect yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, when you're, you have roommates, you just do. Okay. When, yeah. you're, when you're young, you're in SoCal. So, um, so, you know, they give you my first shot. And in, in fact, I, I had worked a corporate job for, I think, one year and one day and walked yeah. out of the place like, peace, bro. Like, I'm never doing this again. I worked on a call center floor for a big real estate um, home servicing company. And I was just miserable sitting there all day when the waves were good, which at the time I just cared about surfing. That was it. Um, when the waves were good, I couldn't take off to go there. And in the winter, like when usually the waves are good, it's too dark to go before or after work. Yep. So I was just like pretty pathetically miserable. Um, wasn't making a lot of money even. So it was just like not worth it. It's like, I'd, I'd rather go back to serving tables or maybe finding a bartending gig. Right. Well, then the economy crashed. This is like 2008. And my friends at the surf shop were like, bro, I need your help, man. Like we can't pay you a lot, but I know you love surfing. I know you would love to work at the surf shop if it was, you know, not on the retail floor. Like, can you yeah. run our website for us? Right. Oh, so your so, friends, your roommates actually owned and operated a, a surf shop. They didn't own it at the time, but they were the the management. Gotcha. They, they managed the the whole place basically. They ended yeah. up buying it later. Yeah. Like now today they own it, but um from the guy who started it. But at the time they were still just like kind of in line to maybe purchase it later, but they ran most of the operations, right? So they were like, can you help us with our e-commerce website? I'm like, dope. What's the budget? They're like, we have no budget. So it forced me to learn SEO, blogging, inbound marketing in, in the context of trying to sell more stuff. Right. Right. So then I had to learn all this other stuff, like the warehouse operations, picking, packing and shipping. Then I had to learn um, photography because they had no budget for a photographer. So they bottle equipment. I, they paid a guy half a day to come down and teach it all to me. So I'm sitting there taking photos for the e-commerce website, you know, yeah. in the, in the back of the warehouse. And so there's a little, you know, surf, cute surf, surf shop girl or 16 year old, like rips, you know, surfer guy jumping around yeah. in and out of things, you know, bikinis. And board so you had to build like a light box and like play yeah. with like was focal length and like color temperatures and all that. It was literally in the worst, dirtiest warehouse you've ever seen in your entire life. And we made it look like it was <laughs> like out of a catalog, you know, it was yeah. awesome. So point is, is just had to learn how to do everything in order to make it move forward, which yeah. wasn't, again, wasn't making any money really at the time, but they gave me a shot and I was pretty good at it. Like I learned how to be pretty good at it on my own. And, um, and it forced me to learn new skills. That was the thing that yeah. was the biggest takeaway from that. It wasn't that it was online marketing. It was just like, like the attitude was, well, you know more about it than we know, Rob. So we're going to pay you to do it. And yeah. I was like, this is shocking to me. Like, so that as a soundbite or as a lesson is substantially and materially different from what we're taught in like an educational program 
which is you need to graduate, you need to be certified. And you know what? You're going to take your test and get 10% wrong, your marks down. Yep. They're coming in and saying, I'm here, dude. You could be anywhere bigger. It's better than me. Dude, like, and, and you know, I, I love these people, so I'm not criticizing them. But the attitude of most small business owners is, I don't have time to learn a new skill. Like, da 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 They've got so much in front of them and, and, and I have a passion for helping local businesses. That's the thing that we have to understand as service providers to them is that, you know, they've got razor thin margins most of the time. They've got a million other things yep. in front of them. They've got risk, exposure, downside, debt, like all this stuff. No, they don't need to learn. They don't have any desire to learn what the difference in the F setting is on your camera to make right. it look good on the e-commerce site. They're just like, can you get it done? Yes or no? Yeah. Right. And that's the way that I sell now mm -hmm. that I sell outcomes, not features or even benefits even more, but especially mm -hmm. not features. Right. So I learned a lot in that process. And, you know, there's details that I'm, you know, like, like examples and stuff like that. But but that was my first exposure to how the insides of a business actually work and how mm -hmm. I could provide value to them and what moved the needle and what did not. That was, I was like being thrown in the deep end, right? Um, so that means that no business owner in the world cares about your F1 setting. They probably don't even care what your studio setup is. They really only care if it sells more surfboards. Yeah. So this was an interesting, um, you know, most of the, like if you work in a surf shop, you do it because you love it. It's usually like minimum wage or close to, and there's no bonuses, there's no tips, like nothing like that. You get it. A discount right on the stuff that you like but it's not a huge discount it's not like so really you're doing it because you want to be around it all day like you want to talk surfing you want to be invited to surfing trips maybe you couldn't get otherwise um you get exposure to the professional scene because the professional scene kind of makes these tours around all the you know the locally yeah. owned shops and stuff like that like i met three of my heroes in surfing like just i was just like oh my god like why am i talking to tom kern right now this is crazy yeah. He asked me to go get grab him a coffee and I brought him a coffee. Like, like oh my God. Oh, so yeah. good. Yeah. I'm like, I don't get starstruck by like, you know, people we see on the Grammys or Emmys, but I was like, dude, this guy is, I'm standing next to greatness, you know? Yeah. And um, so that's kind of why you work there though, is like, it's a good lifestyle. It's cool. It's fun. You get exposed to really cool stuff that the average person does not. Um, and so <laughs> when you're working with people like that, um, they're, they're looking for opportunities, right? And so when I'm shooting um, the catalog, I'm kind of like going, I don't want to offend anyone else, but I want to talk to you because you look pretty good in a bikini and I'd love it if you do this for free, you know, right. for the whole count. And, and literally the thought process is there's no budget, like, you know that, or, or they learn it real quick. And I'm not being paid any extra to be a professional photographer, that's for sure. But mm -hmm. it's going to be like a 12 hour day where you're kind of sweating and moving in and out and you've got, you know, other people. So it was kind of like an all hands on deck thing, but they would do it just to kind of be like, I'm more part of this process. Right. Than just like a dummy retail floor person. Right. Yeah. Like I'm also the model for their website. It's kind of like the vibe I got was like, uh, you know, Oh yeah. Yeah. No, I'd love to do that for free for yeah. 12 hours and be paid minimum wage. I'm like, really? Okay, great. Interesting. Go, go here tomorrow. And so it was this like sort of like eye opening thing for me. And not every local business is like that, but it would just taught me these lessons like, OK, just getting someone involved in the process sometimes is enough to make them like a believer or more of a brand advocate. Right. Yeah. And um, and little things like that trickled out. You know, I'm just giving you one example, but uh, other little things trickled out like on the online marketing front and how big brands perceived us and what they were willing to do with us and not and like things like that. So I feel like I got my MBA yeah. in like two and a half years. And by the time the recession was over, I was like, okay, I got to move on. Now I'm getting other people asking me to help with their web presence. And that's how I transitioned into freelancing, which was the introductory part of me saying, all right, now I'm going to ask you for money, like send yeah. you an invoice, get money. And I'm going to do some things I, I learned at the search shop that I know to work well for your business, Mr. Business Owner. So you yeah. accidentally website designed photography operations digital e-commerce for yeah. a year and a half two years maybe two and a half mm -hmm. 
then somewhere, something in your consciousness, your body, your brain said, I could do this in exchange for money. Was it like a, I have enough case studies, proof testimonials? Was it, I'm not going to do it for free? Like, what was that snap where like, I can be finally be paid for this? Well, it was two things. Like, I felt like I wasn't going anywhere at the surf shop. And that's, you know, again, I love these people. I'm not, it, it has nothing to do with them. It's just, there's not a lot of upward mobility. Yep. You're either the owner or you're an employee. That's pretty much it, you know? Yeah. Um, and so I was like, what am I going to do with myself? I, uh, when I met my wife, I was actually working at the surf shop during the day. They, mm -hmm. What happened was, <laughs> this is actually something that I hadn't thought about before you asked me that question. So this is good. After the recession sort of like bottomed that if you yeah. want to call it that, they were like, look, I can't pay you to be like a website developer anymore. Like we need to recover some profit, get our cash reserves back, like all that good stuff. And I was like, I understand. So what are you saying? They're like, well, we need you to work on the floor like two thirds of the time, mm -hmm. which is just Rob 30, I think it was 30, um, 32 or 33. Yeah. With a bunch of basically kids, you know, anywhere from, like college age people. Yeah. Um, and so they, they straight up thought I was like CIA spying on them. Like, why would someone from upstairs want for you to be down here, like spying on us and like observing? Yeah. I'm like, bro, I'm just trying to make rent just like you. Yeah. That's it. Um, so after a certain amount of that, I was like, oh my gosh, like I really cannot just be like, I got to go out and get something more, yeah. right? Like I got the bug, I got, I got the entrepreneurial bug. So it wasn't as much like, like me being smart as much as it was out of like necessity. Number one, I needed money. And number two, people were seeing this, the, the, the stuff that I did for them. They were my only case study. I'd work with one other small startup surf brand, um, like kind of doing the same sort of stuff with them. Mm -hmm. But people were asking, Hey, do you know a good web guy? Do you know a good, yeah. guy? Do you know, a good SEO guy? Da, 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 da. So finally I just started to go, well, if people are asking for it, maybe I can charge for it and get out there and do it. Right. And I remember reading a blog article that there was a guy who was like a free freelancing coach. Mm -hmm. And, um, I read an article that said, uh, you're never going to know until you just get out there and do it. So I just started yeah. asking like, everyone I knew, do you know someone who needs these kinds of things done? Yeah. And it was all warm contacts. Like I had no, I wasn't doing anything cold. I wasn't reaching out to people I didn't know. I just, I was like, and then a couple of them started to bite. It was kind of crazy. Right. You know, I was like, I was kind of like, why would they pay me this much? Because my context remember was the surf shop was like, we have no money, like no, right. no paid ads. No, we're not paying professionals. We're not paying coaches we're not paying vendors like no that like it's all you just gotta sit there and make it happen bro yeah so, <laughs> so i was shocked like i don't remember what my first invoice was for but it was definitely below a thousand bucks and I but it was I, still your first invoice yeah it's the most money you've ever seen yeah, yeah. And I, I probably made like less than minimum wage you know if you do the math um but i just want to do a good job yeah and, you know um so that's kind of how that started. And then I actually figured out that I was not as hot shit as I thought I was, you know, mm -hmm. with this stuff. Um, and I was given so much leeway and, and autonomy at the surf shop that I, um, I actually went to sell for another guy that was selling SEO to local businesses. And that's about the time me and my wife got engaged and got married. Um, so I was selling my pants off, selling SEO to local business owners. Yep. And he had a system. He had like... VAs in India, cold, cold emailing people. And he had a don't pay until you get on the first page guarantee. That risk reversal. Ooh. Risk, yeah. So I would get on the phone with people and they would be hella skeptical. But I'm like, look, you have absolutely nothing to lose. We're going to do on page SEO. We'll do off page SEO. After about eight months of that, I, f I found out that the guy was doing total black, ta black hat tactics. Yep. And um, <laughs> he had offered, he had, uh, uh, offered me a piece of the company if I continued to grow this, like I was starting to sell significant, you know, amounts. He had offered a profit share plan for me um, mm -hmm. initially because I think he thought that I couldn't do it, right? Well, I surpassed the number that he told me that I would hit, and I'm like, all right, buddy, pony up, you know. And he totally backtracked, like he started. Yeah. And so I think he had money problems. He was not the best of guy, of guys ethics wise. Yeah. And so, but then that's, that's literally the launching pad 
I was like, I think I can figure the tech stuff out. I think I can yeah. learn the rest of the SEO stuff out. That was a launching pad to me starting my first agency because there we go. I had to get the sales part yeah. down. I didn't know how to, I could sell a surfboard, I could sell a wetsuit, I could sell a $500 wetsuit all day. Um, could not sell SEO to save my life when I started out. I was like saying all the wrong things. I just, yep. even though the offer was awesome, it's like the risk reverse offer was fantastic. And at the time, you know, he would get them ranked in like under a month typically. Yeah. It, it was fast. You know, it wasn't like sitting around for six months. So I had to learn how to sell, manage, and retain. And then and only then did I feel like I had the, the skill set and the tools. So, I mean, it took yeah. like five years for me to actually take the leap and go. And you didn't have this like grand plan of consciousness knowing I'm going to spend two years on fulfillment, a year on selling. No, it just, it yeah. happened and the stars only aligned looking back, right? Yeah, I'm not that smart, dude. I, I'm really <laughs> not. Like I... I joke that I'm a caveman and I kind of am. I'm drinking a freaking protein shake right now for yeah. out loud. But that I I was literally hand to mouth until I would say six months after my wife and I got married. I still have no yeah. idea why she said yes to me. But I was broke, at, you know, I was I was making good money selling the SEO for the yeah. first time in my life. I was making like 10 grand a month. Um, but before that, I was literally making minimum wage and bar backing at night to make real money. And I was yeah. making six bar backing at night. So my wife was always like, oh, it's so hot that you have like this work ethic because she kind of knew that, you know, eventually. eventually yeah. Probably, yeah. But, you know, we're getting married and I'm like, geez, man, I just could don't. eventually be now. That would be great. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But very interesting. But my plan was always very short term to make money that month. And and as a function of wanting to do more for myself and more for my family, um, I had to sort of level up at these different stages just to do that. But I was always yeah. thinking very short and immediate term while that was happening, um, which, you know, I don't know if there's a better way to do it. There probably is if you're smarter than me, which everyone is probably. But I, I know, think like, I think that only happens when you got so much brain and money and time space to like sit down and do a year long plan, which you can't do when you're trying to make rent. All right. Yeah. It ain't going to happen when you're starving. There's no other fans or bus around it. I, and I just, my parents, you know, were always paid to, you know, it, it's just like, that was my background. Mm -hmm. My wife's parents are, you know, uh, dad's a doctor or he retired now, but he was a doctor. Um, so she had a bit more of that mindset, mm -hmm. which was the biggest difference between us was the way that we grew up and around money, um, yep. you know, around the topic of money. But you know, she was working full time, killing it at her job. She's awesome at what she does. Loves her job, loves her work. Um, and I'm sitting there going like, no, I'm like super unhappy. I got to figure this out, man. Like, <laughs> you know, and in the back of my head, I was like, bro, is she always going to earn more money than me? Like, that's not how I roll. Like, I don't want yeah. for that to be forever. Like, I was fine with it and grateful. Um, but there was always this thing in the back of my head that said, if I, if I just don't quit at this, Someday I feel like there's going to be a windfall and it's not going to feel like work anymore. Right. Yeah. Like I was scrambling to build skills. I got good at sales. I was like scrambling to learn fulfillment, learn that next thing was finance. Next thing was client relationships. Next thing yeah. was like marketing our own business, which I didn't do for a long time. So it, it started to stack really fast once um, I kind of felt like, like I gave myself permission to be like, I can put these pieces together and actually create a business from it. And that's, that is so hilariously accurate. Like I finally gave myself permission to be great. Like we're yeah. all waiting for somebody to say you can do it. Why can't I say I can do it? Wouldn't that be great? Like, dude, I remember there was a guy that I went, I, I was a um, co-counselor with at summer camp and this guy's like brilliant, right? He, he went to, um, what's that school in New York? That's super famous Columbia. Uh, yeah. You know, Ivy League school. Um, he ended up being in this like direct response uh, company that does like like international branding for infomercials, like you know, big big stuff like QVC. Um, and and he asked me one time. That, so he's he's working for that huge company that does all that mm -hmm. stuff. And then I'm over here trying to start this new agency. He's like, well, how much do you charge per hour? Maybe we'll hire you. And I was like, I don't even know yet, but I just believe in myself. And I just walked around for like two years telling people that 
Yeah. I don't even really know what I'm doing yet. I don't know how much I charge. I don't have an hourly rate, but now I believe in myself. So yay me. And I would just yeah. like, like furiously fail through everything that it took to get, you know, so that first agency that I built, I thought I was being awesome by just yeah. failing through it all. And it ended up being a seven figure agency. Like we were working with some cool brands, some local businesses, like we had a mm-hmm. local attorney uh, who's pretty big, spending a lot. Um, we had some cool brands that my wife's, my wife worked for an ad agency that did all offline stuff. So they shot TV ads, print, radio, all that stuff, mm-hmm. all the hard stuff. And, they, but they just like never did digital. They were like super old school. And um, so they were like, well, when we need some web stuff, can we like subcontract to you? So I made a little agreement with them. Um, but I thought that I was like killing it. The thing that I was doing was working 80, 90 hours a week with my business partner at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was making less than I would make in a freaking being a manager at McDonald's, basically. Yeah. I mean, for, for the time input. Right. And this was the your first version of your agency. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Got it. So I stopped selling for the SEO guy. I was like, that guy's kind of a dirt bag and mm-hmm. uh, and left there. And I said, I know that I can sell stuff and I know that I have the skill set now to learn enough about the fulfillment between me and my business partner to where we can get clients results. Interesting. So, yeah. So I launched my f- first agency doing that. But the first thing that I started doing, which was the biggest mistake in this, that I call that agency my seven figure agency failure, right? Yeah. Because I started being everything to everyone. I yeah. started, I became a HubSpot partner. They were like, yeah. learn inbound. You're going to like kill it with inbound. It's going to be great. It's going to be great, Rob. It was like one of their first partners. Um, and the clients that hired us, it was just like two things like scope creep. Yeah. And then they would always threaten to shop around because digital, they didn't really understand it. They didn't understand mm-hmm. how badly someone could burn you if they didn't know what they were doing. Like they didn't know, understand the difference between black hat stuff and white hat stuff. So yep. it was just like constantly educating them, um, which we didn't charge for. So, you know, we, I mean, there was nights where they'd be like, the client would just wake up and be like, we need a new website. Can you get it done by next week? And they threw and like 20 grand at us and we're like, uh, no, we don't want to do that. But we did it. We were yeah. sleeping under the freaking desk with on top of a box of pizza and an empty six pack, just getting it done, you know? Yep. And and that that kept going and going and going. If we lost one client or we had a month where we, you know, the numbers just didn't line up, we mm-hmm. were immediately in the red. So we have one good month every six months and five, you know, just break even months or or maybe a little bit of a loss, you know, we're basically working for almost three. So looking back when you're trying to be everything to everybody, yeah, was this really just trying to get more experience or was this not knowing to say no? I just didn't know any better, dude. Got it. I was, I thought that that's how you do it. And then eventually the clients will want to give you more money. And then if you just work, keep working hard, It'll kind of fall into your lap. <laughs> Sounds like a corporate job. Keep just, working hard. Eventually, it'll be good. Yeah, eventually, it'll come to you. Yeah. And, and it's important to know I had no help at the time. Like, I didn't mm-hmm. hire any mentors. I, I didn't use any systems that I'd learned about. I thought that I could figure it out on my own further. Yeah. Right. And um, and so after like two and a half years of that, my business partner, I walked and I also had a, our first baby. Um, we had a first baby and we had another one on the way. And my mm-hmm. business partner and I were just stress so thin we're like bro we gotta like shut this down and move on like this is killing both of us yeah i remember our office was above a brewery microbrewery in downtown san diego we were in this cool historic building you know we had like the hipster looking office with the brick you know and the old place that you kind of make cool new and modern um paying way too much in rent and we went downstairs and you know it was kind of like silent and we get a beer we go cheers you know, and uh, he's like, so, and I was like, yeah, I'm thinking the same thing. And they're like, are, are you though? Like, are you not just saying that? Cause I'm thinking that. Right. And it yeah. was like very quickly. We're like, bro, let's just shut this thing down and yeah. figure out anything outside of this is going to be better than what we're doing right now. We're dying. You know? Yeah. Externally, people thought we were doing great. Mm-hmm. You know, we had some good clients that were paying us a high volume of money. It's just mm-hmm. profit was not there. Right little to no profit every month. And, uh, so, so I'm like, my wife is saying, okay, well, what are you going to do if you shut it down? I'm like, I'm going to 
get a sublease for our office to get out of the debt. Mm -hmm. I'm going to take all the debt off of my business partner's plate because he's about 10 years younger than me. And mm -hmm. I honestly didn't know if he would recover if he, you know, took his part of the debt. And I was like, I know I can work my way out. If I have to go back to bar backing or whatever, I'll, I'll figure it out. Right. Yeah. So I take out all the debt. We make a YouTube video where I'm basically like being a real estate agent. It's still online somewhere. Um, and I'm telling them all about how awesome the space is and why they should want to sublease it. Mm -hmm. And I went home that night after making that video and I just like lost it all. I just started like bawling my eyes out to my wife. I was like, I feel like a failure. I feel like I let everybody yep. down. I feel like I let my team down most of all. Mm -hmm. Clients will be fine probably, but they're like, what happened? Why aren't you doing this anymore? It's like embarrassing. You know, it's a little bit humiliating too. And, and, and at the end of that night, my wife asked me that she's like, maybe you should just go get a job. She didn't ask me. She just kind of said it like that. Like, maybe you should go like get a digital marketing job at like a big company or something. Mm -hmm. and that actually pissed me off. Same. Yeah. I was like, fuck no. Like, I turned from like shame, humiliation to like yeah. rage. And I was like, I'm going to make this happen. Give me yeah. Blah, blah, blah. It, like yeah. I was angry at her. I was just like, I felt like I did that to me all of a sudden yeah. I, with that question. And I so thought, at that at that moment, I'm happy. I will never be happy doing that. Job. There's no way I will never. Yeah. Be happy, you know. So then I I said, give me a few months. I'm going to put a plan together. And that's yeah. So go ahead. So at that moment, like looking back, was there like any part of what you're doing that was working? Like you could build a website really well. Like you could do client relationships really well. Was there like some spoke to the hub where you're like, that's what I'm double down on? No. Or you, everything was so cloudy and you had no clue. Dude, no, we weren't very good at any one thing. Like we were pretty good at like, like we, we could be fairly good at any one tactic, mm -hmm. right? But putting like a whole comprehensive plan together um, it was really the clients that were sort of dictate dicta like we were glorified freelancers. Yeah. Like the clients would just throw out what they thought that they'd already decided that they wanted and we'd price it, agree on a price. Then we'd just get to work. You know, it wasn't and like when you, when you agreed on that price, it wasn't, you were agreeing to someone else's price, putting on a margin, you were taking on the work, right? Yeah. yeah. So a lot of it, it, like I call that the, the sales fulfillment paradox, right? we were trapped in that cycle. So I would sell, I was okay at selling, not great, but okay. The pricing and packaging would come in. I go, bet we need the money, mm -hmm. you know, get the, get the funds, get it going, get the agreement signed. And I would turn right back around and start, start fulfilling on it. Like my partner yeah. and I were the ones doing most of the fulfillment. That was the other problem with our business was we had help, but no one could do anything unless they asked us how to do it. Right. If we had no repeatable systems or processes no reputable skill sets, et cetera. And so that's where all the money was going was they would just spend eight hours to do something I knew how to do in 30 minutes. So then- Which reinforced you doing it. Yes, terrible, like freaking awful actually. So I felt like I was not only paying them, it which builds resentment by the way. Yes. You've gone through that. You're like, why can't you learn this employee? Well, it's really your fault, dummy. Yeah. You're the caveman, not them, right? So, <laughs> so- the way I, I understand your question, the way that I arrived at how do I solve this problem if I'm going to mm -hmm. do another swing, another at bat, was when I asked my wife for that leeway for those couple months. The first thing that I did, like we sold all our furniture, found a sub lessee, like got out of all that stuff. And, you know, you know, that took up probably like a month yeah. to do all that stuff. And and then I was like, OK like back to zero, back to square one. I printed out, this is how I did it. I just thought, hey, I'm going to look, I'm going to be like a forensics auditor and go in. Mm -hmm. and I printed off all the line items that I made in my, um, I think it was like a FreshBooks account. Yeah. It was like in FreshBooks, you have invoices where you can just type in stuff and save certain services or, or fees or whatever. And I printed it out and it was like a stack of papers like this. Yeah. Which it made me sick to my stomach. I'm like, I already know what the fucking problem is. Right? So all the products. Yeah. Dude, it was like we were custom creating crap on the fly every day <laughs> for years. And so there was thousands of line items in our invoices. And I was like, holy crap. So the key here is to simplify it. And I was starting to like look around for people who are having success with more specialized agencies, you know, because I still want to do digital marketing. Yeah. That was great. Still want to help 
small local business owners thought that was great. Um, and so I printed all that out. And one of the most profitable line items we had, we did like 1% of our revenue from it, but it was Facebook ads. Mm -hmm. like our clients started to ask us to manage their Facebook ads for them. And by the way, Jeff, this is back when you could throw a poo on the wall and it would sell. It was like so cheap, <laughs> so responsive, so good. It was just like, yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. It's the easiest thing I'm going to do this year, right? The only problem was there wasn't, I wasn't doing enough of it to make it like to move the needle, right? Yeah. So, um, so I'm like, I think there's something there, but it's so new. I don't really know what I'm doing. They were just, you know, here's 10% of our budget, throw it, throw it at Facebook ads, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so I actually asked Mike Cooch. Um, Mike had just moved from Denver, moved his whole family out from Denver to San Diego. Most Did people it, don't go that way. Most people go the other way. Well, no, see, I think that's a misconception we can get on, on like, we can argue about that on a whole nother segment because I got yeah. to say about that. But no, people like a lot of people move to California just because they don't care about the cost. They don't care gotcha. about it. They move gotcha. to the water. I imagine Miami's the same, right? Um, they're like, nope, I love waking up every day and not having snow. I, that's worth every penny cool. out, you know, and more. Right? And that's what Mike's sort of the deal was like, he loves snowboarding, but he wants to go on a ski trip, come home and have it be 80 degrees and sunny, you know, when yeah. he gets home. Uh, so he didn't know many people personally there in town. And um, I kind of like offered to take him out to lunch, not expecting that he would say yes. He was like, sure, why not? And was super cool about it. And I was basically like picking his brain, which I hate doing. I'm like, mm -hmm. you know, it's like, I don't, I don't feel right asking people for their professional opinion um, without paying them. Like I just, yep. and, and so I was super grateful and I like paid for his lunch and everything. And he, he was like, look, you're on the right track. You're, if you were able to book seven figures worth of business in your agency and you were working that hard, the problem is not your sales skills. It's not your fulfillment. It's not your price. He's like, it's just your model, dude. You're working the wrong model. Mm. You're doing too much custom work for too many different types of clients. And that is not scalable. It never has been or never will be. And so he's kind of like this genius who like figures out how to make repeatable service. He calls them services at scale, right? Mm -hmm. And he did that with two companies in the IT space. One was an actual IT company and the other was a marketing uh agency for it companies nice and so you know killed that game before he moved out to san diego was like really good at it and he's like i just interviewed this guy billy jean down in little italy mm -hmm. you should go check out what he's doing because he's doing like a couple hundred grand a month just doing facebook ads and i'm like but for big brands and he's like well yeah but they're like gyms they're like orange theories they're massage places they're like they're all local businesses which is what yeah. your lane is I was like, holy shit, do you think you would like be willing to sit down with me? So he makes an introduction. I go to Billy's office and, you know, Billy's a salesman. He's yep. very good at selling stuff. And he's even more persuasive in person because he's actually a great guy. Like mm -hmm. you want to be friends with him. You want to hang out with him, all that good stuff. Um, and so I ended up agreeing to a, like, I paid him like 15 grand over the next three months for him to teach me the exact model that he was doing with all these franchises. Mm -hmm. All he was doing, this is all he was doing, was saying, I have one ad, one landing page, and it's all like just lead pages at the time, not even click funnels, right? Yep. And I'm um, running the ads for the local business, and these people are making so much money for my service, it's disgusting. Yep. And so he was charging like 500,000 bucks a month per location, but it was the same campaign, Yep. same offer, same, sequence like everything right and all he would do is say say okay now that i'm in now that i'm like cleared from the home office for orange theory we're an approved vendor uh you know everyone like their name just spread like wildfire so he had hundreds and hundreds of accounts mm -hmm. and his whole team was basically just sitting there cloning campaigns and lead pages cloning yep. campaigns in facebook monitoring it reporting it etc right yeah so that's when my, I was like, okay, I'm going to do this. And I didn't have the money. I just put it on a credit card and was like, crap, I guess if this doesn't work, I'll just go back and get that job. You know, <laughs> crap. <laughs> oh yeah. my God. I was just like, Ugh, I don't, but if you saw what he was doing, it felt like anyone could do that. Yeah. Like he just showed all of it to me in his office with the team. And I was like, 
I think I can do that. I know that I've got some gaps to fill, some stuff to learn, but I can do that. He's like, the biggest thing with this thing, dude, is not that, it's not like, does this work? It super works. He's mm-hmm. like, the thing that's going to be hardest is eating dog shit for the next two months while you get this ramped up and saying yeah. no to everything else that you were doing. Yeah. Right. Cause it's so easy to be like, Oh, someone's throwing me a 10 grand check to do another website. Do I get wrote back in for the short term money or in eight weeks I could have $30,000 a month recurring with clients that are making money from this campaign hand over fist. And I really don't want to touch it. And that's what I ended up doing was tell my wife, like I might have to, pay back rent to you or whatever, you know, like in a couple months, can you pay the rent until I can get, get this thing going? And I think it was like, I called my old employee back, my one employee who's still with me today. Her name's Betsy. I said, Hey, do you want to help me with this stuff? And she's like, yeah. And I'm like, okay, give me like a month to sell all these accounts. And then I can afford to bring you back in. Mm -hmm. And I trained her and Billy and his team and helped train her and I to get those first accounts off the ground. And so I had like a $30,000 a month Facebook ads business for local businesses mm-hmm. within like three months of shutting the old, the seven figure agency failure yeah. down. Like I shut that thing down three months later, I had 30 grand a month. I was like, this is crazy. And yeah. I didn't even have, I didn't even have a fresh books account anymore. I canceled that and I signed up for Sam cart and the yeah. checkout, this is what forced me to do it was I was like, if someone can't see this page and force checkout on their own, Meaning I can't just add another line item to to fresh books. Then it ain't gonna happen. Then it's I'm forced to say no. You know, they can't haggle, I can't bend. It was it yeah. was like a really, really good thing for me to do that. Yeah. It was just like, here's everything you're gonna get. Here's it's clear as day, right? Mm-hmm. It's monthly, it's recurring. You can cancel with a 30 day notice anytime, but that's all I'm gonna do for you. That's mm-hmm. it. You know, and that's that's how that that transition started for me. And that's when I actually started making real money for the first time in my life. Yeah. Just, you know, so that's, that's how I turned the corner on that one. If that makes sense. So the, uh, do we call that a productized service? Do we call that like a one product, one ser- we call it a productized. So like you're only doing things that like, that's it's really five it. things you're doing. Right. Yeah. So having that and having it duplicate, 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 like Mason Gray is saying in the comments, yeah. that enables you to have a couple of things. And I'm saying this for everybody, even though you know it. The first is speed. Yes. You can do something in 30 minutes. Yeah. The second is confidence. I've seen this happen so many times. I know it's going to work and not it's going to work. And then you have control. Yeah. You have the ad and then you get to control what goes in it versus letting your brain flare off and say, you know, maybe it's a branding thing. Maybe we need to control something else like that. This is the only thing. And I have found in my business with the dentists, when I come in and say, I don't do that. I don't do that. I only do that. All of a sudden, it's much easier for them to trust me. If I came in and said, I can do everything, they go, "Mm, I don't believe you. Or, you know, the the other thing that happened with with me in the the first agency was, was, um, you know, the basically the race to the bottom phenomenon, right? Like, oh, my cousin's nephew's aunt's uncle can do it. He says he knows about inbound marketing. He can do it for cheaper or for free, you know? And I'm like, sweet peace, you know? Um, I can't lower my price at all. I'm not even making money on the money that you're paying me, right? Yep. Um, So that happened a ton. The other thing was um, when you're doing custom work, since you're behaving like an employee, they go, well, why don't I just hire that in house? Yep. It happens all the time. Right. Yep. And so if your behavior is, is too close to what they're used to do, like they're used to saying, okay, employee, I, I want to do this. So you go do it. I'm paying you this hourly wage and that's the deal. Right. Um, if you're selling an outcome or a result, which is the way that th- that was actually the main focus is if you're mm-hmm. selling an outcome or a result, and you've put these bumpers on the offer. Yep then the only thing that they have to decide is one or zero. Do I want to keep paying Rob to get that result or not? Yeah. Right. And that's, I know it sounds close to being the same, Mm -hmm. but psychologically it's not the client. Like years different. Way different. And and that's not not something I understood the first time around Mm -hmm. at all. I thought that if I constrained myself, that would mean that I'd have three clients and I'd make $1,500 a month. Yeah. Total opposite happened. Like Billy, Billy had people calling his office saying, Hey, my friend signed up for your service. They made 
35 grand last month for mere pilly little service. Uh, sign me up. <laughs> the best. Just, you know, I'm like, what the fuck? Who says, that? who has a business that, like, it sounded too good, you know, it was a little bit like Wolf of Wall, Wall Street ish. Yeah. I'm like, bro, are you, are you sure? And he's like, dude, I, he's like, it's crazy, but that's, so that's, that's how, you know, I turn the corner on that. And it's, it's yeah. the way that I've taught folks to do it ever since because, mm -hmm. I think, I think for most people, right, especially if you need money now, like I did, right? Mm -hmm. If you need that cash flow now, so that gives you a buffer for you to plan and make, you know, make your next move, do whatever it is you have to do for your family. Um, you have to have that peace of mind that, that I've got enough margin at both in my, yeah. my books and in my day, right. Yeah. To be able to graduate to the next level, whatever that is for me. Right. Yeah. And if you don't have that, it's insanely difficult to do that. This is the best way to do it because, you know, you're not wasting time sending invoices, proposals, negotiating with the customer, the client, uh, educating the client, trying to yeah. save the account, yada, yada, yada. It's like all that stuff just goes away and it's very binary. It's like one or zero, black or white, yes or no. And that affords you as, the you know, the whole purpose of this business thing is so you can make money mm -hmm. and get, buy your freedom back. That's the whole yeah. point. So if it's not doing that, then the business isn't serving you. And if you're not being served, then it's a ticking time bomb. There's only yeah. so much time before you totally lose control of the situation. And, you know, I, I've seen people just totally crumble on under the, I, the one thing that I will give myself credit for. And it's the biggest lesson that I learned is it's OK to throw in the towel for yeah. the right reason. Right. Because I'm stubborn. I just I'm like, I'm not quitting. You know, that's just yeah. like default attitude. But um, if you're working a model that's not working for you or that isn't that is essentially broken. Yeah. Then you're just giving more of your energy into something that's just going to keep sucking and taking and not giving in return. And so you should be slap, slapping yourself in the face or some, you know, a friend or family member slapping yeah. your face. Like, Stop, dude. Like, what are you doing? Stop working a broken model. Yeah. It's just it, it'll it'll take it'll take way more than it gives to you. And it's supposed to be the opposite. Yeah. Right. Like, so that was a big, I'm just trying to give you guys like sort of the highlight of the lessons Yeah. on arriving here. Hopefully you guys don't have to go through all that BS. So, so now know. that we figured out that you know how to sell, yeah. you know how to fulfill, you know how to productize service. Now that you've got time and money and margin, so you yep. can have the brain space, the money space and the time space to upgrade, you upgraded big. Then, yeah, you went to 500 plus clients, yeah, in less than 18 months, yeah. So, this is what, what? happened, dude. yeah. I know it's freaking crazy. So, again, once I had that margin in my days and in the finances and everything, I was able to. So, I, I, this is crazy, right? So, I have this, um, you know, you see the movie Top Gun, right? The first one, a lot of the scenes, I mean, who hasn't? <laughs> a lot of the scenes are from this place in San Diego called Liberty Station, right? Yeah. And Liberty Station used to be like a naval training center, and they the government sold it to a like a commercial developer mm -hmm. in Diego. And so my office is now in Liberty Station at like a Regis Center. So just mm -hmm. a little one door office just for me. Um, and <laughs> and and so I'm, Liberty Station, there's terrible signage, like the buildings are all historic and so you can't yeah. put normal signage up on them or any of that stuff so for like two or three years it was just sort of like an exploratory thing it's this giant campus right with these old buildings and they all look the same so when something would open it would kind of be like oh hey i found this thing today like that's a common thing to say in liberty station because yeah it's just kind of like you know it's, it's a little bit more uh it's, it's not like a strip mall the businesses are all together next to each other, but it's like, if you don't walk by it and pop your head in, it's really hard to tell what the heck is even there yeah. in most of this place. So I'm walking, um, I had knee surgery a couple of years ago on my, on my knee and the, the doctor was like, look, don't stop doing um, PT on your knee, like rehab it, keep it strong, like keep moving, you gotta work on it, getting older, like, okay. So I've been dying to join a gym, I just hate the gym. Typically, like most gyms, big box gyms, I just, they're not my jam, right? I'm walking by one day and I see a gym in Liberty Station and I go in and it's 
freaking huge. Like I opened the door, I was like, there's no way that this keeps going. Like, and it's just, it's one of the biggest um, buildings on in the whole uh, compound. Yeah. Your station compound, right? So, um, you know, I'm sitting there, I'm like, what am I doing? I ended up getting a tour from Haplin, who you just yeah. saw. And he's like, hey, my sales guy, Haplin was setting appointments. And Ryan, who became my business partner, I'll tell you about how that happened here in a second, gave me the tour mm -hmm. and sold me a year up front gym membership. I was just poking my head in. I mean, yeah. This guy was like a phenomenal salesman. Not pushy at all. It was a really nice facility. It's more expensive than the big box gym, but it had like all this cool amenities. It had showers, infrared sauna, like lockers, um, full basketball court, functional training. I mean, it's just like this really cool place, right? Yeah. And um, so I ended up giving him my my credit card for like a thousand dollars for the year up front. Mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, this is crazy. Like, I'd never do crap like this. Yeah. And he's like closing up the sale and I'm sitting at his table and uh, at his little desk. And he goes, so like, by the way, what do you do for a living? And I'm like, oh, I help local businesses with Facebook ads. He goes, awesome. What am I doing wrong? And he turns his screen around and shows me him running his own ads. And he's right. like, over here gives me a little bit of a budget. And I just know that I'm like, he's like, I'm a sales guy. I don't yeah. really know about this stuff. Can we possibly hire you? I'm like, yeah, I'll come back tomorrow and we'll sit down and we'll take a look at it. He was making, so again, just building the skill from Billy. I saw five or six things he was doing wrong in his ad, mm -hmm. 20 seconds. Yeah. I was like, dude, I can, this will turn. And, and I didn't tell him how easy it was to do it. I was just like, I hope you hire me because I'm going to freaking destroy it. You know, <laughs> or yeah, I'm going to fix your shit. You better fucking hire me. <laughs> yeah. I just gave you a thousand dollars. I want to make it back. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I come back, uh, land the account. And in the next two or three months, um, I start signing up at other gyms just because I was mm -hmm. like, hey, you know, if I can find other facilities that are similar, I'm trying to rinse and repeat as much as possible now. Right. Yeah. So I sign a few of them up and none of them are doing as well sales wise as Ryan is. Right. I have the benefit of coming in to see him because now I'm going in the gym one to three days a week and I'm seeing him I'm like, hey, what's up? How's the campaign going? Like, da, da, da. And I figure out that he's kind of a unicorn. Like he's just a really good salesperson and he knows his stuff. Yeah. So I'm like, what are you guys doing differently than all these other clients of mine? So again, back to the margin thing. Previously, I would have had no time to sit down and just be like nerding out for three hours with him at the gym while neither of us had anything better to do. Now I do. Yeah. Right. So um, I put my hat on. I'm like, dude, I want to figure this out because they're making 50, 80 grand a month mm -hmm. from my piddly little bill. Right. Yeah. And um, so I figure out that there's two things that he was doing that were different. We got a good, a really good lead cost at the beginning, but that leveled off like it usually yep. does. It wasn't all that. Him and Haplin were sitting there text messaging people one by one using this gym software that was like antiquated at the time. Mm -hmm. But the point is, is that they were sitting there nurturing all the leads. They would follow up better than anyone that I'd seen, follow mm -hmm. up new leads. And they would nurture the leads that were dead. Right? Right. They weren't doing it at scale. It was just, hey, there's no one coming in to, to sell. So we're going to sit there and, yep. you know, so I'm like, holy crap, that's that's huge, right? Like, that must be the reason. And he's like, well, yeah, there's no other way to do it, in my opinion. And I'm like, well, no one else is doing that. Right. What do you mean? I'm like, I got dozens of clients and you're the only one that does this. Like, swear to God. And so then a light bulb went off. For both of us i said let's go to lunch next week i want to talk to you at the time he was thinking about how to graduate out of that business because yeah. you can kind of only make so much you know it gets monotonous all that good stuff and so we went to lunch and i'm sitting there going like if you and i started an agency together that specialized in fitness locations you know and and i'm showing him what billy's doing with orange theories for example right yeah uh, and I'm like, bro, I mean, this could be a hundred to $200,000 a month business if we do it right. You know? So we started small. Um, I got a little bit bigger of an office in Liberty station so he could sit next to me. Mm -hmm. So I started some ads and, and wrote the copy on the ads and, um, you know, made a, like a simple lander and stuff like that. And he would sit there and take the sales calls mm -hmm. and we were sitting there selling, at the time we were selling agency services at, you know, 
it was just like, we're going to do more of that. Yeah. So that turned into Fit Club Accelerator, which um, we got in with a handful of franchises. Uh, one of the biggest ones was Nine Round. Uh, we yep. had CrossFit boxes, like stuff like that, like smaller studios, right? And we found out that they charge more, but they're terrible at the ads and the, and the follow-up, right? Mm -hmm. like some of them needed help with sales training. So we actually packaged our agency services up with those three things. We said, we'll do three things for you. Most of them came in saying, I want ads. Yeah. Right? We said, well, why don't you reactivate your database first? Because that requires no ad spend. Right. Why don't, and, and a few months in, we actually poached Happen from the gym too. So he would sit there and text message for us instead yeah. of this. <laughs> but what we said, so we'll do that. We'll add lead nurturing to whatever stuff you've already got going, whatever track mm -hmm. sources, because those are, that's found money, right? And then at the end, if you still need ads to keep your pipeline full, then we'll turn on some ads and then you're going to pay for the ad spend outside of that, right? Yeah. So that's how we grew so fast was besides Alex Hormozzi's gym launch, we were like, we were like the go-to place for gyms of that size. Yeah. Uh, we're, you know, a distant second to him, but we came out of nowhere and right. he called me one day. I was like, dude, what the hell are you guys doing? And I'm like... I'm not telling you. <laughs> no. <laughs> like, we don't teach him to run six week challenges. And he had a supplements and nutrition company, yeah. food, you know, all this stuff. I'm like, we're not doing any of that, bro. And um, so the reason why we were able to scale that so fast is the same thing that happened to Billy. Yeah. We were getting such good results without them having to deal, deal with or do a thousand things. Mm -hmm. um, and we could repeat it across every location anywhere pretty much yeah. it all it only didn't work like three to five times i think in the yeah. whole time that we were doing it um so we our confidence level was super high i was like look you know if this becomes a whiff you know we're refunding your money it's no big deal right. but chances are you're gonna make like 10 20 25 grand in in the first month and we're charging you 5800 to 9800 depending on how big they were um, and then you get to keep all the recurring revenue on the back end, and that's where the real money is anyway. In, mm -hmm. in that's right. So we went from proving it in that one location, that one private gym, you know, health club, to stamping that out across um, all the gym studio space. Like we had cycle bars, we had um, yep. yoga studios, we had like anything in that little little vein of the fitness mm -hmm. location industries. We'd pretty much touched and proven. Um, so we just have like a million case studies. It just felt like they were coming in every day. It was nuts. Beautiful. So our word of mouth started to spread and we were getting really good at the ads, really good at the sales and offer part of it. And then our fulfillment was just lapping anything else that they had tried. So it was like, well, you can go out and try other stuff, but why wouldn't you just do this instead? Yeah. Or, or do this so that you can pay to do other stuff. You know, it'll fund all the other stuff you want to do. And people are like, okay. So it's, it sounds like you had narrowed down your fulfillment so fast yeah. and it took five years for you to narrow down your fulfillment, yes. right? Yes. But it ended up from that stack. There was that one piece of paper yeah. and you said, I'm going to do that again and again and again. Yeah. And do you think it would have worked without the sales coaching or the text message coaching or like telling them what to do or how to do it? Like without the sales strategy? Would the reactivation produce the results? I don't think so, or maybe. Um, so that's kind of hard to answer. I, I think it would have worked well without mm -hmm. the sales training, but it was easy for us to just record that and made we made like a little membership section with all the videos and, and the yep. training on it. And we added one Q&A call a week with Ryan to answer yep. some of those questions. So it was really easy to fulfill on. It's like, why wouldn't we have done it at that point? Um, but really for them to understand, like the same inclination I had as an agency owner to overcomplicate the, the whole dang thing. Yep. It's the same thing that humans will do in any sort of fulfillment scenario, in my opinion. Yep. So really all we were doing was beating the drum and saying, no, this it really is a simple. Yeah. No, you really don't have to change your offer. Like your sales process needs to look the same every time somebody comes in. Mm -hmm. Um logistically it's not that hard to do you know like if you got five slots a day we'll fill those five slots right like there's not that much but people would try to overcomplicate it or try to find problems that weren't there because mm -hmm. they're used to doing that right yep. and so a lot of it was just 
you know, keeping their mindset on track with the system and how to get the most out of the system. Does that make sense? Like, yeah, it's, it's, it's a, the, the coaching or the strategy part is keeping them on the right path. Yes. Removing the, the options or the distractions of. Yes. Very interesting. So it was more about that than like trying to add another thing. It was more like keeping them focused on the right thing. Yeah. Um, you know, a lot of them would come to us for ads because they were like, oh, everybody else is killing it with crush uh, with uh, Facebook ads. You know, mm-hmm. I see my friends or my competitors crushing it with it or I'm getting outspent by Planet Fitness or something like that locally yeah. in my area. And we're like, well, why are you paying attention to them? You guys don't even offer the same thing as them. Right. So don't try to copy what they're doing. Do this instead because it gets you what you want and it gets your members what they want. And that's, you know, if you just focus on that. You know, like our lander was just, it said nothing about Facebook ads. It says want our ad linked to a lander and the lander just said, want us to add 25 to 35 plus new members per month to your studio for you. Mm -hmm. That was our ad, right? And we get on the sales call and they'd say, oh, how are you doing that? We'd say, well, you know, we're, we got just these three pillars, very simple for anyone to understand, but ads actually are the last thing that we recommend because why would you pay money? If you didn't have to, to get this result, like you're after the members, right? Yeah. Well, how many, if you got 30 members a month for the next three months net, that's like a hundred new members in a quarter. What would that do to your bottom line? Yeah. We'll just do some quick math and like, holy crap, dude, that adds like 25 grand a month in profit to my, to my business. And so 25 grand a month is, (laughs) it's like life changing money for a lot of people. Right. So what I like about that narrative is that you get to say, do you want to take the short, simple, easy path? Yeah. Or do you want to make the take the difficult, complicated path? I want the short path. The shortest path is the DBR lady. We're going this way. Yeah. Right? It's like, you know, if you're not a believer, we get it. But you've seen all our case studies. You've seen all your peers doing it. It works. And I'm telling you that it'll work. I just can't tell you how well it'll work. Like, yeah. Some, some locations have better lists, some locations just, you know, it's the market. Like there's things, there are variables there, but the thing that I can tell you is that it's the most profitable place to start. We can start booking appointments tomorrow without ad spend. Does that sound good to you? So yes, you know, so they just, you know, they, they did not come to us. Like most people came to us Mm -hmm. with a different solution in mind, but we asked them, well, isn't, aren't you doing all those things in order to get more members at your gym to get more customers? Yeah, of course. Like, you know, don't insult my intelligence. I'm like, yeah. no, I'm just making sure because when you plug our thing in, it's going to be different than when you asked for, but it's better. Right. And it'll get you to your goal quicker. And people are cranking this out month after month after month. It just works. So why wouldn't you start there? Right. Mm. So, oh, I want to start blogging and doing newsletters. Do you guys do that? It's like, well, why would you want to do that to get more members? Why would you just get more members? Yeah. yeah. So we're like, if the goal is to get more members, this is doing it in this order, this specific way is the shortest, fastest, simplest path to get you there. So why don't we try that first? If for some reason that doesn't work, we can talk about other things. Yeah. But let's try that first because that's what we see to work right at the gate 99.99% of the time. Okay. Like it was a very simple conversation in our sales process. It's it's so strange seeing the the natural evolution of products and services and like a, a human being's growth, which is got to try all the things. Everything's going to work. I can do it all like this a wanderlust of business experience. Yeah. And after a while, you're like, no, man, this is the one stick. I'm going to keep swinging this one stick and it's going to work a lot. And this is it. Bro, I this is all before high level was existed, by the way. Right. So we didn't have high level. Our Scipio bill was forty-four thousand dollars a month, at forty-four grand a month at its peak. <laughs> we were logging in and out of each account. They had no agency dashboard, right? Yeah. We were logging in and out of each individual account every five minutes. I just had a team of people just sitting there because that was the only way that we could respond to the text. I'm like, you cannot let five minutes pass without logging into each location. People are like, that's impossible. I'm like, well, we need to hire more people. Yeah, but we were literally doing one thing really well the entire time to the point to where I, I sold my agency. Like at the end of all that, I, we were kind of getting burned out on the model a little bit. Like mm-hmm. we pushed so hard and grew so fast getting a little burned out, but I ended up selling that agency. And, and near the end, I said, why are we even offering Facebook ads? Why, yeah. why wouldn't we just do reactivation as a service? Because 
it was a 90 10 thing or 99 one thing at that point it wasn't even 80 20 by that yeah. point it was just like this is the thing that gets them the result the fastest every single time it's just so dang predictable there's almost no downside it's all upside the people who have incredible lists are killing it like yeah it was disgusting like we helped a rock climbing facility she had to stop the camp we sent like 100 contacts one day mm -hmm. and we got like 10 opt-ins or 10 uh, appointments booked she's like go ahead and scale that up you know we're a big facility it's fine we sent a thousand the next day and she so like, fuck. she's like stop and she sent us a picture and posted in our facebook group and when she yeah. was like you know I just, yeah we can't take it you have to stop it please stop so she never ran a single Facebook ad. There was another title boxing owner, uh, this guy named Chris, who had a really qu high quality list, like only 11,000 contacts, but it was just mm -hmm. super high quality. He was a great operator. Signed up with us. Um, we started his, his reactivation the, the first week of December, which is typically in the gym business, November, December, are terrible months. Like yeah, most people just throw in the towel, but even try. But um, we're like, no, 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 like this will work, bro. So he booked 425 appointments through the first work uh, week of January from that database. And he became the number two title boxing in the world uh, that month. It just came out of nowhere to number two because of that. We never okay. ran a Facebook ad for him either. Like, okay. All right. I've done my fair share of reactivation campaigns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is how I do them. You tell me how wrong I am okay. in front of everybody. Okay. All right. I do reactivation. It says, hey, name, been a while. Just checking in, anything I can do for you. Okay. That's what we've been doing. Why are my clients not becoming number two in the world? Um, the it's it's the copy, the offer. I mean, obviously, that's yeah. like the ad you're sending by text message, right? Mm -hmm. So what should or like I mean the last bullet point is like the, the secret cheat sheet, right? Yeah. That always gets like a client ROI. Yeah, I mean, one of those things has to be the copy you're sending by text message. It, right? it actually has a lot to do with that. What you are describing is not a bad strategy just to do the, it's like a jab, right? It's like Gary V style. Hey, I'm just checking in just because I give a shit. There's yeah. nothing wrong with that inherently. To get the kind of results I'm talking about, you have to put on your direct response hat. Mm. Right? So I'll give you an example. I'll just give you the one that we use in our gym business forever. Uh, we offer this free in our group. So, you know, really easy to do. It's just... Hey, first name, this is Rob from Nine Round, right? Um, I have a few free 10-day passes here at the front desk, period. Uh, would you like for me to reserve one for you? Mm -hmm. Question mark. That's it. That's right? a million yeses in 15 seconds. Dude, yeah. And then there's like the way that you follow up with that, there's a couple of ways to sort of... Um, magnify the response of that and one of them is what we do at the end of that sequence let's say they say yes yeah i want it and we go back and forth them get them booked in after they're booked in to come in and they've mentally committed we say great would you like for me to say save another one of the free 10 day passes for a friend mm -hmm. and so we try to turn that one yes into one to four more people coming in to take advantage of it bring, bring the, the kids friend. bring the wife bring the friend everybody's right. going yeah uh, do you have childcare? Yes. Yeah, I do. Do you have any other friends who have kids who maybe want to come out and work work out with you? I can save one of those free passes for them if you're interested. Sarah, we're going to the gym. Yeah. Bring the kids. Yeah, yeah. It's free. You know, so um, a lot of it was that, right? Like it, it, it was it was so simple that it was painful, right? Mm -hmm. But it's really easy to F it up if you don't know what yeah. you're doing, right? You can talk too much. The biggest mistake I see people saying uh, sending is, they send too much information in the first text or the follow-up once they get a response. So it's like an ex-girlfriend message. If I got a scroll, it's like, yeah. Exactly. So there's there's uh, response best practices behind it too. Um, that mm -hmm. can be part of it. The other thing people do is they're fucking lazy and they just want to send a link. And you know, people don't like if you're gonna go through the effort of sending a two two way text message to somebody, you book them in manually. That's the mm -hmm. way that you're going to get the best result. If you just send a link, they'll think immediately. What, well, I'm going to ask you, what's Damn the first scam? It's a robot. Or I'll do it later. But yeah. Let's say they trust you. They're just like, oh, I'll do that later. But you're putting more work on them. Yeah. Right. So you just make it as easy as possible. Think of like a hotel concierge. You know what, Mr. Miller? I'm going to take care of that for you yeah. right here and right now. Right. Um, 
again, okay, just to check in later, like you did, that's fine too. I get now, now it's more popular to get text messages from ho hotels, right? Um, hey, just checking in, Mr. Mr. Bailey, like, um, you know, it's been a day since you checked in, is everything good to go? Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's a nice thing to send that I, I never really respond to, but I'm like, dang, that's kind of nice. Right. Yeah. But it's not the direct response thing that got me to stay at the hotel. Correct. Right? So you have to get, there are two different strategies and you got to get that person's butt into the place of business or in the sales environment of choice, whether it's a sales call, house call for home services, whatever the case may be, you got to get them there first to get the opportunity to, to do the rest. Yep. Right. So that's exactly. like the short answer. There's a million ways to screw it up. We've, the other part of it is like, we just did it so much that we found out what worked and what didn't. Right. So we had the advantage of like a lot of real world data. Right. Right. To, to arrive at sort of our methods and Haplin, you know, to Haplin's credit, he's kind of the genius who like combed through all that stuff and really made the system as efficient as it could be over years and years and years of experience. Right. Now we do have high level and we can just, right. well, of course, you know, it's just like, you know, so easy to do, but you know, it's funny. The first thing, <laughs> so on that front, what am I doing wrong? Most people download our snapshot and then they immediately fuck with it. And I'm like, what's the Stop whole touching thing? it? <laughs> yeah. I'm like you may as well just do what you want anyway, bro. Like, yeah. just go. like, but, but that's, so there's a direct response element of it and a, an intimacy thing you know, because you get such good um, open rates with text messaging, right? Yeah. You get such good open rates with it. You have to like really kind of be mindful of what an opportunity that is. Like there's no yeah. better way right now to get cut through all the noise and get in touch with somebody on such an intimate level. Like, you, you know, I've got my my family on my uh, screen here and it's going to be next to like text messages from my wife and my mom and our friends and like da, da, da. And right in there is the text message from nine rounds saying, Hey, do you want a free 10 day pass to come in? Yeah. You know, check it out. There's also some psychology behind the free 10 day pass that like the offer itself, um, which is probably overkill for this, but there's things like that, that just, you know, the nuances kind of make a big difference because um, you have the opportunity to really like talk to someone. It's Jeez. weird. There would have been no way to discover those nuances without the repeatability again and again and again, doing it a million times type of thing, right? Yeah. Like poor Haplin used to do this one by one in his gym software and there was no broadcast function. There was no, all it was, was just, so he got to sit there and try to type different stuff to figure out what worked the best. Yeah. Um, so that, you know, for that reason, again, you can look at, it's like, it's like, stop guessing, right? Like, mm -hmm don't just throw something out there without any thought behind it or figuring out if it actually works, use what's proven. That's what I did with Billy, right? That was, yeah. if you want to say that, what was the turning point? I hired a mentor who had a disgusting amount of experience doing the exact thing that I wanted to do. Yeah. Right. That was the biggest difference. I mean, I give you kind of the, like the journey part of it, but that was the biggest difference. So when I'm telling people to do, activation campaigns and like just copy what already has been proven to work as no i want to mess it up i'm going to do it differently i'm going to try something thank you very much totally yeah it's just very you know, cool that's human nature i'm not like saying that you're a bad person if you immediately think that that's how everyone yeah. thinks okay but i'm challenging you to not not give into that because it's just the harder way to do it and who wants to do that nowadays yeah. you sit down and think about it it's like i was dumb for a long time and i paid the price I don't want to go back to paying the price again. I'm dumb enough. I don't need yeah. more dumb. Like I, I got enough of that in my head. So um, a lot of it is that. It's just saying like, I'm going to stick with what works and I'm only going to worry about changing stuff or getting fancy with it if and when it doesn't work. Right. And that's a hard thing for a lot of people to get over, including myself, as you've learned. No, it's, so. it, there's something that happens after... When I turned like 34, that's yeah. where my mind started to go to that, that process of like, if it's not broken, I'm not going to touch it. And then totally. when it breaks, maybe I'll consider like trying to fix it, but it's got to be really, really broken for me to put like my mind stuff into it. My life has yeah. been simpler. My margins have been higher. I have that time margin that you talked about. And it's, it's incredibly frustrating, I think, for people starting out. Yeah. To say you can't be creative, you can't be antsy, 
You can't have the wanderlust. Like the, the reasons why you got into entrepreneurship are not the reasons why you built a business. Right. And it's this weird, janky juxtaposition of like, I got to do everything and just explore my opportunities. No, man, if you want to build a business, it's much, much different. I forget who told me this, but to your point, someone told me this. I'll never forget it. It was during that time period that I described where I was kind of figuring this stuff out. Someone said to me, um, all the problems in business have already been figured out. Right. <laughs> and so you think you're, you know, special because you figure something. It's like you're just not special. Right. Like I, it's hard for people to hear that because we're, you know, at the beginning of this conversation, we we're talking about how. You know, it's the opposite of what society is telling us, right? No, you are special. No, yeah. you're you can do anything. It's like, really? Like, yeah. The the older that you get, and especially in the business world, like the older that you get, the more wisdom that you sort of curate. I think the more humble you get, um, hopefully at least. Yeah. And when you look to somebody who like no one would question Warren Buffett's investing strategy at this point. Yeah. But you know, he didn't start getting rich until what, how old, like 70 something? Like, yeah. super, like most of his wealth is being created here at the tail end, right? Yeah. So it would have been easy to criticize him when he was doing those compounding things yeah. that had already been figured out. And he's just being Mr. Consistent to the point to where that compounding started to really stack. You know, just I think like 10 years ago is really when it started to hit that hockey stick curve for him, right? Yeah. And so you have to be be humble enough to realize that that's how it works most times than not, right? Like the stuff that is consistent day in and day out, the stuff that's already been figured out, that's most of the success stories that you're going to see. That has to yeah. do with almost all of them with rare exceptions. So yeah, love, people love to talk about Mark Zuckerberg. People love to talk about Elon Musk. Guess what? If I was Elon Musk, I would have already been doing it. Yep. I wouldn't be sitting here chatting with Jeff Miller, you know, God bless you. I love you. But it just, you would already be like some kid phenom doing some crazy Correct. crap. We've there. already kicked in. Yeah. Yeah. So it's like, it's business is not that complicated. It's actually very simple when it comes down to the, the bones of it, the brass tacks, you know, it's yeah. all that stuff that's already been figured out. We should be adopting and using, not being like, Oh, I want to see if I want to try it my way and see if it, I can do it better. I hope that may, like the context of that. It does. It's, like, it's, it's going to be, it'll be challenging for people who are new to agency, new to entrepreneurship. It will not be challenging for people who are used to or in yeah. the line of business. Right. Yes. Um, so like Frank Kern's a great example, right? Like Frank spoke at the high level event. Uh, mm -hmm. I wish I would have met him, but um, I met Frank in San Diego. Uh, this is back when he lived in La Jolla, but he was, um, he was at somebody's office and I just happened to be there at the same time. I met him for a quick minute. Super funny dude. Like he's great. Um, but then I started getting on his, email newsletters and he was a big Infusionsoft guy for a long time, right? Yeah. And I basically took all of those emails over the years and and basically turned those into what's now our reactivation campaigns, right? Yeah. Like I turned that strategy into but the key there is that I didn't innovate that. Yeah. Like and he didn't even do it. Like, you know, he's he talks about Dan Kennedy and like all the guys he learned from, all the direct response guys. But those things that have been figured out have stayed true over the years no matter what medium has changed you know no matter what medium is chosen yeah. a lot of those things that they're just like principles or laws like gravity right there's yeah. principles in business that are never going to change the mask over it or the tactic that gets used to deploy that might change but that's that should give everybody on this call like you know a giant woody <laughs> like it's like you don't have to figure all this out yeah. You just take something that works in one industry, apply it to another. Yeah. It's, That's it's it. like way more simple than we want to give it credit for, you know, like it's, it, it should be a relief to everybody hearing this, that, that that's actually how it is. Um, because, you know, most of the charlatans like to make you think that it is complicated, mm -hmm. right? The more mysterious and complex they make it sound, usually the more like charlatan the person, right? Yeah. The true business laws and principles are so simple that if if you forget about them, you're literally spinning your wheels. Yeah. They're just dead simple. So I think it's it's something that we this, this is why I love teaching database reactivation, reactivation so much. 
it's dead simple. There's very limited downside. There's it's almost all upside. Mm -hmm. you can get going with it tomorrow. You can improve any campaign tomorrow by adding lead nurturing to it, right? You can help any business that has a list, which is basically anyone who's not brand new, right? And there's millions of those. Like you can never help them all in one lifetime. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I like teaching it because it is that simple. And if you can get out of your own way and get in and just implement it, then you can have a great deal of success very quickly, helping somebody in the process, creating value in the marketplace, creating real results and mm -hmm. in, in real commerce, right? It's not just like an activity, which, yep. you know, that has its place too. Mike Gooch teaches, you know, activity-based stuff. And I, I love it. I love that. If you're going to go that direction, um, definitely do it his way, right? But I like getting results for small businesses. I like helping them. I like feeling like they got a ridiculous amount of return for the money that they paid me. And I also like charging more for my time. Yeah. Like I don't like selling low ticket services. That's just my preference. Right. So I like charging high ticket. I, I that's just my, my personal preference, but all those other things, it doesn't, it takes one to three things to make that happen. It doesn't take a thousand things or a hundred things or 50 things or a dozen things. Yeah. It's usually one to three things. Like, we talked about you could just do database reactivation for businesses and make a ton of money doing it. It's a great service to offer. You know, it's like, so. Love it. Well, let me let me bring this to a close. Yep. Um, I think you've agreed to like a group fifteen minute call or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, Beautiful. I'm happy to. Yep. Um, for everybody watching, if you're watching live, hashtag Rob My Face. Um, the first three people do it. I'll do a group intro. I know it's always fun to do my face, right? Um, yeah. Rob My Face. I'll do a group introduction over the weekend. You've got one too. Oh, perfect. <laughs> it's ridiculous. I meant to post this on your page and because uh, my friend Casey sent this to me when we got back from high level. Yeah. And he wrote, he said, uh, I know all my admiration for you can give you a big head, but you deserve a big head. So I got you one. Love Casey. <laughs> Love I was going to post this on your page and say, see, now I'm the dummy with the biggest head. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. Um, again, for everybody watching, hashtag Rob my face. I'll intro you guys over the weekend. Um, it's always a pleasure, Rob. Um, from here, just so everyone's in the know, Rob, you and I are going to ballpark a database reactivation paid masterclass. We're going to go into detail what it's like to do that client getting, that client fulfillment, that text message, that selling, selling 4,800, 6,800, 9,800 DBRs, fulfillment, make sure they're taking care of all that stuff. And the reason why we're doing it is not necessarily because the money thing we're doing it because that five or six year journey of finally nailing the one thing you're good at is so incredibly frustrating. Yeah. If you could just skip to the end, right? That's what, that's the opportunity. It's just saying, you know what, I'm just going to rinse and repeat what already works. So okay. more details on that will be coming later, but I think you wanted to say something. And, and just to, just to like, like th this is life changing money for me and my family guy. This is, was not, you know, oh, I had a good run and, you know, now I'm not making guys. I am, my wife and I were on a call with our, our wealth management team now that we have, which is crazy. Team? Yeah. yeah. Well, team, not a, a team. Yeah. I have like a family <laughs> office now. It's like crazy, right? <laughs> and um, it's ridiculous to say out loud if you knew my, I had very humble beginnings like growing up, yeah. you know, so, um, but the, the, you know, th this has been, you know, multi-million dollars for the past four and a half, five years. Yeah. So that's, it's literally like I went from when I met my wife, I was making minimum wage during the day at the surf shop mm -hmm. or close to that. And, and then at night, minimum wage bar backing, then I make some tips, right? Mm -hmm. Went from that to four and a half, five years later, multi-million dollars per year, you know? And like, that's, that Insane. is not something that it's crazy. Right. And now a lot of it is recurring revenue as well, like through high level and, and the, yeah. you know, the affiliate program there. So this can really change your life. It, and I'm not saying you have to do it my way or you have to even do reactivation, but this is one way to do it. And it's not, it's not an in, in, insignificant flash in the pan amount of money. Like it's it, it this is like stuff that'll hopefully I'll, I'll be able to pass down to my kids and their kids and all that good stuff. Right. That's, I, it, that's how good it can be. It's this like, blows my mind, by the way to be sitting in an online internet room yeah. chatting with people that are making online internet money 
when five years ago, 10 years ago, it was impossible. Totally. Absolutely it's nuts. A wild time to be alive, man. And, you know, since COVID, like, I don't know if, how much y'all pay attention to trends and stuff, but since COVID, like I asked this, I walk around, uh, you know, just town here and no one's showing up to work. I'm like, where are all these people gone? You know, like they're doing something different. They got to eat. They got to put gas in their car, like all the rest. Right. And I think that we're at a really critical time in our country where people are, COVID forced us to think differently about how we earn money. Yeah. Right. Which is a huge gift to you. Mm-hmm. If you're considering going into this, because Jeff and I, pre-COVID, we would have to talk most business owners into even considering this online stuff. I had people come into my office. I had to shake their hand and do a whole pitch. Dude, it's like night and day. Diff- it's never been easier, better, more productive. Um, it, like the opportunities are coming to you now, if that, that, if that makes sense. And so if you haven't given this a fair shake or you don't think you can build a real business around it, I mean, sh- dude, not couldn't be farther from the truth. It's, it's a perfect time to get into this, you know? All right, ladies and gents, we're going to bring this to an end. I know there's some Q&A and all that, but hey, we've been an hour and a half for 30 minutes of our schedule. Sorry, guys. we got to pick a time, right? Um, again, hashtag rob my face. Uh, rob my face. I'll throw your name in the hat and we'll see what pops out. I'm going to pick three people for a 15-minute one-on-one. And if you'd like to be on the short list for the Masterclass, just hashtag Masterclass. And I'll reach out to you directly and give you first dibs on the tickets. Rob, don't hang up. We're going to debrief everybody. Right. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, see you later. Thanks, Bye. I'll see you. Appreciate the opportunity.